Okay, I'm going to go through with you the poem Stanzas Written in Dejection near Naples by Percy Shelley. Uh, this is one of the longest poems in your anthology um, and I personally think one of the best poems that you can write on because it changes and there's lots of different interpretations um, for the speaker's feelings which lends itself well to creating a developed and detailed essay. So let's start with the first stanza. Um, which begins, the sun is warm, the sky is clear, the waves are dancing fast and bright. So it's quite clear that uh, Shelley is using very simplistic language to begin. We've got warm, clear, fast, bright, nice simple um, adjectives being used, not a particularly uh, vivid or descriptive or romantic image. Um, just quite simple and we have again quite simple um, personification the waves are dancing fast and bright so the poem is opening clearly on a relatively positive um, tone and we get the idea that nature is positive and beautiful and perhaps Shelley is actually using simplistic language to show that part of nature being beautiful is how simple it is. Blue isles and snowy mountains wear the purple noon's transparent light. The breath of the moist earth is light. So from the third uh, line, the language becomes slightly more complex. And again, we have um, personification being used with the blue isles and snowy mountains where wearing the purple noon's transparent light. So we have the colours of blue and purple, we've got the transparent might of the midday noon and the breath of the moist earth is light. So again each of these lines adds to the idea of nature and beauty and we even have some nice vivid colours being used here to create an image of somewhere that is seemingly very beautiful and that our speaker seems to be uh, somewhat in awe of. And the next line reads, around its unexpanded buds, like many a voice of one delight, the winds, the birds, the ocean floods, the city's voice itself is soft like solitude. So if we go first with the image of the unexpanded buds, suggesting that perhaps something is still yet to come from this earth, um, perhaps a link to fertility or growth, um, something is yet to come. And then we have uh, the image of delight, like many a voice of one delight, the winds, the birds, the ocean floods. So Shelley then moves to listing the rest of um, the things that he can see around him. And again, just creating this uh, image of beauty and nature. And that is slightly contrasted by that last line where we learn that the city's voice, so we perhaps um, have a slight change here where we've gone from being immersed in nature and beauty um, to the city, so to uh, modernity and slightly more urban image. But again we learn that even the city uh, is soft like solitude. So in this image that is immediately given to us we have this idea that the sun, the sky, wherever this person is, is it's particularly beautiful but even the city um, that is perhaps near the place that they are is also soft and quiet. And that perhaps can be read in, in different ways. Perhaps that's because nature is so powerful and beautiful that it even calms um, the city down. And if Shelley is talking about a city like Naples, we know that to be uh, very busy, very noisy. And so um, it, it would be quite a surprise for that to be soft like solitude. So perhaps we have a moment here where the speaker um, is at complete peace and has found calm um, in all of their surroundings. And then we move to stanza two, which immediately begins and introduces 
um, our speaker and we have uh, their perspective from the first person and we have that throughout so I see I see repeated and it opens firstly with I see the deeps untrampled floor with green and purple seaweed strewn I see the waves upon the shore so here we can assume that our speaker is talking about or our poet is talking about um, the ocean itself and Shelley has capitalized and personified um, deep to mean the ocean and I think uh, this adjective here is quite important um, rather than saying something like the deep's untouched floor it is untrampled which perhaps implies or suggests um, that this is the only place in nature that has been untrampled by humans um, so we have that first indication that there is some kind of perhaps conflict or negative aspect to nature um, or indeed humans in this poem so i see the deeps untrampled floor with green and purple seaweeds strewn so again we have the repetition of the greens and the purples so we have those um, lovely beautiful colors um, that are filled with life um, we've got the seaweeds now, but they are strewn. So maybe that verb there is suggesting again that there's kind of a lack of care, um, perhaps linking to uh, the untrampled floor. And our speaker sees the waves upon the shore like light dissolved in star showers thrown. So again, um, we have our speaker perhaps sitting on a beach watching the waves come by. Um, and he describes them very simply in these lines um, and then we have this simile here which describes the waves like light dissolved in star showers so a particularly beautiful simile which perhaps um, has a slightly kind of heavenly or, or holy aspect to it um, and maybe even quite a magical element to it but again, there is an element of negativity by the final word where, like untrampled, we've got strewn and thrown. So the waves are still being thrown. So again, repeating that idea that maybe there's a lack of care. I sit upon the sands alone. So again, we have our speaker ending each line with something slightly negative. So here we learn that he is lonely and the lightning of the noontide ocean is flashing around me. Okay, so here everything starts to perhaps slightly change and we get a much more negative portrayal of, um, of the image that, that this speaker is trying to create. So the lightning of a noontide ocean. So perhaps slightly strange that there's a, um, a thunderstorm, a lightning storm happening at noon. Um, and this is flashing around him. So we've gone very quickly from a warm sun and a clear sky and waves dancing fast and bright in the beginning of this poem to things seemingly being strewn and thrown and, untra and or perhaps trampled. And now we've got lightning flashing, flashing around him. So we can interpret that in two ways. Perhaps it, that is exactly what has happened. Um, and we have maybe more of an indication of kind of the violence um, or aggression or power of nature or perhaps this entire stanza is acting more as a metaphor for our speaker's feelings um, and perhaps instead as he sits on the sands alone the lightning of the noon tide ocean is flashing around him perhaps the lightning is something to do more with his feelings um, for maybe his mental state um, it's not quite clear at this point and a tone arises from its measured motion how sweet did any heart now share in my emotion so again it, it's quite an ambiguous few lines here so we've gone from the lightning flashing um, and arising but then we go to the exclamation of how sweet so again, quite a strange uh, way to describe a lightning storm. Um, 
And yet, again, perhaps it's implying um, our speaker is in awe of the beauty of nature and the power of nature. And then this line here that ends, which reads, did any heart now share in my emotion? Perhaps um, that's our final indication that our speaker is indeed very lonely, um, even though that they feel positivity and sweetness and happiness and joy from the beauty of nature that they are watching. This final line suggests a sadness that they are completely alone and that nobody else is sharing that emotion with them. And that's confirmed when we get to the third stanza where our speaker exclaims alas and that acts very much like a volta um, or a pivot um, as things very quickly decline um, in their mental state and it, as you can see from the repetition of nor things become very negative i have nor hope nor health nor peace within nor calm around nor that content surpassing wealth the sage in meditation found and walked with inward glory crowned nor fame nor power nor love nor leisure okay so i think we have about nine nors um so a huge amount of um, negativity uh, throughout this stanza and the idea that our speaker has an absence of everything. And the things that he feels absent from or that he feels that he's lacking in um, are things that are not of material um, goods or objects. They are you know, hope and health, peace and calm. They're feelings and emotions that he feels that he does not have. Um, he does not have, um, he's not content, uh, he doesn't have the inward glory that others do, um, nor fame, power, love or leisure. So all of these things um, that would perhaps make somebody happy uh, in life, he does not have. And then he uh, turns to others, I see whom these surround. So his perspective turns to people around him. And those people that surround him, um, smile they live and call life pleasure to me that cup has been dealt in another measure okay so interesting here that only those around him will call life a pleasure um, but to our speaker he feels um, with the metaphorical cup of life that has not been dealt to him so to me that cup has been dealt in another measure so that metaphor confirms that he feels that life has not given him a happiness um, or perhaps luck. Okay, and stanza four slightly pivots again as it begins, yet, yet now despair itself is mild. So again, it seems like in every stanza change, there's a movement in his emotions. So he has gone from feeling that he has nothing, no hope or health or, or wealth or power or love, and yet he calls his despair mild. So a strange adjective um, to use for that. And we don't know here whether that is somewhat ironic or um, perhaps time has moved on or perhaps he is rationalizing his own depression and thinking itself as mild. Yet now despair itself is mild even as the winds and waters are. So again nature is used to compare or explain his feelings. So his despair is like the winds and water. So perhaps because they move and they pass, um, perhaps because they're temporary. Um, I could lie down like a tired child and weep away the life of care. So that slightly changes um, the tone of the, the stanza again. Um, even though despair is mild, he still feels like a tired child. And that simile maybe implies his vulnerability, the fact that he's kind of lacking someone to look after him, um, or that he feels that he needs someone to look after him, and weep away the life of care, which I have borne and yet must bear. Okay, so to cry away his life, and he feels like that is something he must bear rather than live through. 
till death like sleep might steal on me. So again, we have the idea, um, and a simile again, that death is like sleep, and if he's lying down like a tired child, that will um, make sense as if he wants to go to sleep forever. Um, but there's a, also a sense of calmness to it, almost that his death is where he'll find peace, and the idea that it will steal on him, um, which will hopefully, I guess, be as quick as possible for him. And I might feel in the warm air, so again, the last time that we heard warm was in the initial stanza, the sun is warm, so it's almost slightly cyclical here, and we've gone back to the beginning, perhaps where he once had happiness, where that warm sun was, he now might feel in the warm air, my cheek grow cold. So perhaps we are back with our speaker sitting on the beach and um, watching the, the warm um, sun and we're watching the blue skies and the clear sky. And he maybe feels like this is where he would like to die. So maybe that is his, his dying place. Um, and perhaps it's in nature. And I might feel in the warm air, my cheek grow cold and hear the sea breathe over my dying brain, its last monotony. So here, again, it is cyclical because he seems to want to return to the place that made him happiest in this poem. Um, and he seems to want to return to nature. And stanza five, some might lament that I were cold as I when this sweet day is gone, which my lost heart too soon grow old. So again, we have a slight change in the perspective. We've gone back to these other people, um, other people's perspectives or views on what they might think um, when he dies. So some might lament. He realizes maybe that he does have people that care, that I will cold as I, when this sweet day is gone. So there are elements here or indications that there is some hope if he sees the day as sweet. Or uh, another way of saying that is that the day that he dies is sweet. So is it a sweet death or sweet to live? Again, anything that is ambiguous is good to explore um, in your essays. Which my lost heart, too soon grown old, insults with this untimely moan. So we have the repeated idea that time is not, um, he has not followed the time or what he thought would happen with his time um, in such a way and that his heart is lost. So he feels maybe he's grown too old and it is an untimely moan. Maybe he's dying um, when it's not his time. Maybe there's a moment here where he feels like he does have something to live for. And then he returns again to the people. So some might lament, they might lament, but I am one whom men love not and yet regret. Okay, so we have again that statement, that idea that he feels lonely, he feels unloved. And yet regret, unlike this day. So we turn to the feeling of regret, but then we have the small clause here that says, unlike this day, so regret is perhaps not on the day that he dies. And yet regret, which when the sun shall on its stainless glory set, so we can have that um, perhaps metaphor for the last day um, of his life or for his death. And regret will linger, though enjoyed, like joy in memory yet. So quite an ambiguous ending um, to this poem, and I guess it could be seen in a positive light. Perhaps he is saying here that there are moments of kind of, well, he says that joy can be enjoyed in memory. So joy will remain. Um, it will continue in his memory. And there's almost this beauty to his death. The sun shall on its stainless glory set. So there's still beauty. 
um, in death and the fact that he will meet um, or return to nature again. Or there's perhaps an idea that he is indeed regretting his own death or his oncoming death and yet regret unlike this day which when the sun shall on its stainless glory set will linger so regret will linger and he will um perhaps regret his death unless he is in fact talking about uh, those that will lament him um and regret will linger like joy in memory yet so perhaps um either those uh, that didn't stop him or those that um, perhaps weren't close to him by the end could have helped him and, and their regret will, will remain or perhaps our speaker's regret will remain um, when he dies. Okay, so that is just a very quick overview of this poem. Of course, there's a lot more that you could um, annotate and interpret and make sure that you have your language techniques annotated um, in detail. And once you feel confident in this poem, you might want to start looking at potential essay questions such as this one. How are the speaker's thoughts and feelings presented? Which is a typical um, essay question that we get with CIE. And what I said at the beginning of this uh, video was how I think this poem is perfect for a GCSE essay that answers a question like this, because the emotions of the speaker develop so much and often they are ambiguous, which gives you an opportunity to explore in alternative interpretations. So just a very quick plan, which perhaps um, might help develop an answer. Um, if we look at the beginning and the speaker's thoughts and feelings, we obviously start with a more positive um, feeling, kind of in awe of nature um, and the beauty of nature. And our speaker generally just feeling um, positive and happy. And then there are definitely moments of loneliness um, in that second stanza and then into the third. Um, so we might have loneliness or indeed just depression. Um, and then it changes um, once we get to kind of the fourth. Um, and fifth line again, so perhaps um, you might merge in this second stanza quite a lot, sorry, second paragraph, um, so you might talk about um, everything in, in the second stanza that suggests that they're lonely, particularly um, this line here, and then you might talk about the repetition of the negatives and the idea that everyone else has been dealt um, a cup of pleasure rather than him and, and delve into that metaphor. Um, and then there might be a point to make um, about a sense of hope and often what I say in my class is um, to try and get something insightful or slightly different in your final argument um, and perhaps hope is slightly more insightful than just talking about our speaker feeling depressed um, perhaps he finds hope in death. Um, and happiness in death. And you could explore lots from that fourth stanza, um, how he feels that his despair is mild like wind and water, um, and that cyclical return to the sea. Um, and then that final stanza gives you a lot to talk about and whether he feels uh, regret um, or joy. And you might have a fourth stanza to show that kind of ambiguous feeling or maybe you could um, use that for your conclusion and um, so you can say regretful or um, about death and you can explore the different interpretations um, in that final stanza. So for me a perfect um, essay to answer that question would delve into the different um, feelings that the speaker feels as they change throughout the poem going from positivity to loneliness to perhaps hope and happiness in the um, perspective in the light that he thinks that he might die and then maybe there's a moment where you could say but by the end it's very ambiguous and um, explore the different interpretations of what he means by regret and that might just come in a conclusion if you don't have time to cover that. 
Okay, thank you.